The humble stool can help us better understand creationism and its new face, intelligent design, and how they both differ from the science of evolution. Stools are constructed with two basic parts. The legs provide support to the seat, which is really the main thing that we are interested in using. In my simple analogy, the seat represents a particular belief and the legs are the reasons that people use for having that belief. In formal science, the seat is a specific theory and the legs are observations, evidence, facts, information, or data that are consistent with that theory. Creationism or intelligent design, and yes they are for my purposes one and the same, is a belief that is held for real and particular reasons. A key reason is that religious texts are clear that the world and its biological life were created by their one or other God. Individual passages provide evidence to adherents that are then synthesized and interpreted in a particular way. A second source of belief for creationists, and most religious people alike, is tradition. When generations of a family have accepted something as true, few are willing to break the cultural inertia. Together, interpretation of passages from old books and family and community tradition provide reasons why people believe that life on Earth was designed. But for a number of reasons, these two lines of belief are not enough for most people. Many supplement their reasons for believing in a creator with what they call creation. Christians need to look no further than the book of Psalms in the Bible, which reads, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament sheweth his handiwork. Advocates of design argue that life's complexity, the flagellum, the eye, the brain, even the domesticated banana, provide evidence for the existence of God, the intelligent creator. The religious have argued for centuries that creation provides support for the very existence of their gods, but the creationist ID movement argues more they argue that the complexity of life results from a designer. To them, life explains the existence of God, and God explains the existence of life. This presents a circular problem of logic, and something has to give. A religious person who was uncomfortable with this problem of logic could consider two things. One, stop using God as an explanation for biological complexity and continue to argue that life provides evidence for God's existence. Or, two, argue that support for the existence of God created biocomplexity comes from old books and ancient traditions alone. The awkwardness of where biological complexity fits in the minds of religious creationists reflects to a great extent the efforts of this man, Charles Darwin. Over a century and a half ago, Darwin saw that biological complexity could be much more useful than simply providing support for a heavenly designer. He asked the right questions, gathered relevant observations, and developed his own set of stools in support of his broad theory of evolution. In the early 19th century, the newly formed ideas of geologist Charles Lyell opened Darwin's eyes to a time scale that allowed him to think about evolution. Fossils suddenly had new meaning. They linked the present with the past, and the extinctions of ancient forms of life was becoming obvious. Understanding geological time scales was a crucial part of Darwin's conceptual framework. Competition among individuals was the gemstone of Darwin's contribution. Not all members of a community survived, and those that did had a reason for doing so. For Darwin, the key reason was that they had features that given their environment made them more suited. They selectively reproduced and as a result the attributes of the population changed over time. Inheritance was the weakest part of Darwin's model. He lacked our present day understanding of genetics and mutations, but nonetheless he formulated his broader theory from other converging lines of evidence that modern genetics has largely affirmed. One mistake that critics of evolution make is that they don't understand that theories build on each other and are often hierarchical. Darwin drew from diverse fields of study, including paleontology, embryology, morphology, biogeography, and population dynamics. Within each, facts are built into theories that are themselves assembled into broader theoretical constructs. As individual sciences have matured over time, evidence for a theoretical evolutionary framework has been cemented. 
This synthesis has been most advanced by research into inheritance. Traditionally, relationships among species were described based on careful analysis of looks. For fossils, genetic evidence is usually out of the question. Today, evolution could be entirely supported through genetics alone. This new evidence is far greater than Darwin could have ever imagined. The development of the sciences to support the concept of competition have also matured. Volumes of information about the morphology and biogeography of species has improved our understanding of species environmental relationships and the meaning of adaptation. Insights into the remarkable attributes of plants and the behaviors of animals provide countless new examples of evolution in action. Since the 19th century, our understanding of geological and biological time has been revolutionized. Geographic patterns reconstructed from the theory of plate tectonics, once known as continental drift, explain why species are where they are and why their closest kin lives where it does. The fossil record has continued to supply us with exciting and confirming evidence for the interrelationship of species and for the widespread failure of past life due to local and global changes in the environment. These facts and theories of evolution tell us a most excellent story of Earth, far greater than any ancient storyteller ever heard or could ever have imagined. The cumulative effect of well-disciplined and well-structured scientific inquiry has led us to a mountain of evidence and theory that supports the now quite undeniable fact of evolution. The font of life is decidedly pre-existing life of different and often simpler form. Those who learn about evolution are truly studying a mountain. So why does intelligent design conflict with evolution? In centuries past, when the key question on the table was the nature of God, Life's beauty and complexity was used to support and affirm belief in a supreme being. By the 1700s, the minds of intellectuals were changing as new scientific discoveries forced a muted question to the table that had long been afforded a presumed answer. Where did all this biological complexity come from? Could it be from something more than God's whim? Generations of scientists have shown us that biological complexity need not be explained by a designer there's a far less radical explanation that is perfectly consistent with the evidence. With our modern understanding of evolution providing this explanation for life's complexity, beauty, and frequent failure, the argument from design has become a stool without a leg to stand on. Life need not depend on God any more than God depends on life. Old books remain, but traditions are being toppled and design as an explanation for Earth's diversity of life simply needs to be reconsidered.